Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ready to go? Check, check, check. All right. It is 11 o'clock, folks. So that means it's time to start. We have a lot to cover in an hour, so let's go ahead. Uh, my name is Tom Hope. I'm a Deputy Chief of Staff to the President, and I'll be your moderator slash timekeeper today. Uh, welcome to our audience live right here in the Lewis Auditorium at the College of Medicine uh, and online as well. Uh, we'll have a, um, one thing I wanted to, to note, this is a conversation, uh, not a monologue, and we're hoping to get some back and forth on some, some topics about the future of UCF, and um, we'll have an opportunity at the end to address uh, topics of concern, of, of maybe a little more detailed kind of parking or other things like that, but we're really interested in your ideas as they relate to three questions the President will outline uh, in a second. Uh, about our future and our potential and how to get there. Um, we'll spend about 10 minutes or so on each of those questions, and you'll see there's microphones uh, on the left and right over here, so we'll alternate between those. Uh, we'll also be getting questions from online. Uh, and again, if you have more specific comments or questions outside of the main thrust of our uh, talk today, uh, if you could save that to the last 15 minutes. Uh, also ask that you be respectful of other people's time at the microphone, so if a topic's been covered, uh, know that we'll need to move on to another topic that has not been covered. We look forward to a great conversation, so without further, further ado, let me introduce your president, Dale Whitaker. Good morning. Well, first of all, let me just thank everybody for uh, being here and spending this time. I know how precious uh, your time is. I also want to uh, uh, say hello to those that are watching online and welcome your participation uh, through online questions. This is a broad forum. This is open to everybody, open to anybody that's part of our family, part of our community. So although we're having it here at the College of Medicine and I'm anticipating quite a few of you are affiliated with the college, uh, we also welcome those of you that are coming from uh, other parts of the campus out here to participate today. This is uh, early in my tenure, uh, and I plan for it to be a long one. Uh, and in a sense, we are early in this institution's great history. So I've heard uh, said that if you want to create a great city, then create a great university and wait 200 years. And if you look around the United States or even around the world, uh, that actually plays out pretty well. But UCF is not one for waiting around for 200 years. And uh, I like to think that we kind of live in dog years. So what it takes other people seven years to do, we try to get done in one. Uh, so if you think about us being 50 years old, and um, I'm absolutely convinced that we have a, at least a 500-year history ahead of us, uh, we're really setting the patterns, the culture, uh, the infrastructure, uh, the areas of study, uh, our expertise. We're really setting those. We're in the second half of our first century. So we're very much in a building phase right now. So some of the things that I really want some help thinking about are uh, what does that next 50 years look like in this specific uh, part of Florida. What does it mean to be uh, on a peninsula and living on a coastline, uh, pretty much as a whole state? Uh, what does it mean to have a population that's growing very rapidly in the southern parts of the United States uh, across the Sun Belt? Uh, what implications does that have for other parts of the world and how are we similar and different than other parts of the world? So I want to think broadly about that. Second thing that I want to really challenge us to think about um, is uh, what does it mean to be, I kind of hesitate to use this word 21st century, uh, but what does it mean, what, what is the future of higher education in the United States and what are the patterns, what are the characteristics that will be relevant as we move forward? 
And let me tell you how I'm thinking about that just a little bit right now. Um, I went to Texas A&M University and I went to Purdue University, both AAUs, both uh, probably in the 600 to 800 million dollars worth of research revenue, neither with medical schools, um, both land grants. And I think about what made them great. And uh, if you'll just indulge me for a couple more minutes here, um, a couple interesting patterns, and I'm gonna bring this together with great 20th century universities, a couple interesting patterns. Number one, when the United States was emerging out of the Civil War, and probably a more important pattern was the Industrial Revolution was just starting, moving from agriculture to manufacturing in the United States. The United States created, kind of by accident, I would say, the land-grant university movement. But what it did was it gave uh, access very intentionally for the middle class to become uh, educated. Uh, and so what it really did was it drove the United States through an industrial revolution that differentiated it from many other countries at that time. The second one that happened that was similar to that, where again, it was not about the elite, it was about bringing in uh, economic, uh, other economic classes other than the elite economic class. The second one actually was the GI Bill, again, emerging out of a war. Um, with a lot of people that had done service for our country and wanting to bring them into a new economy and recover and build an economy for post-war United States. What happened here that I think was kind of interesting was as you moved from the 50s into the 60s, the Vannevar Bush era began, which really was this experiment of importing the research university concept from Germany you know, it was not only a research university, but it was tied to the local economy. Um, and at the same time, the United States made a strategic decision to invest innovation dollars, research dollars, into universities, which again was kind of an unusual move uh, from a country's point of view. So what happened again was we brought in GIs from uh, all ethnicities, from uh, all incomes from all over the United States, and uh, Texas A&M was the one I was familiar with at the time. Texas A&M built a tent city, literally a tent city on the parade grounds to accommodate all these post-war GIs that were coming back. Uh, Purdue University was actually a, a secret Navy signal uh, operator uh, and populated their uh, men's residence halls with secret uh, cyber Navy operators. I thought that was hilarious. So, but but the, the point here, is that the United States invested in these great universities uh, for research, and the GI Bill brought many, many people in, and we're, many of us are, uh, are products of that. So here's the question. What do the great 20th century universities look like now, and what does it mean to be a 21st century university? So I characterize the great 20th century universities, many of them, as being pastoral, right? Talent goes there, gets an education, usually fall and spring, goes back to a city or somewhere else in the summer, fall and spring, goes out, fall spring, and then leaves. So talent is exported. Um, there is a research engine in the university, but not a large IP engine outside of the university that activates that research. You can think of Gainesville as I talk through this. Um, so 21st century universities, I believe, are deeply embedded in the economy of region. 21st century universities are identifying talent that's native in a densifying region and creating a talent engine that brings companies into it rather than exporting the talent out. Um, these, these are just some of my thoughts right now. I don't know that any of the great 20th century universities got inclusion and diversity right. I really haven't seen any great examples of that, of the great 20th century universities. So we want to be the model, a model, hopefully there will be lots of us, but we're not going to wait on anybody else. So we want to be a model, and I think we already are in so many ways, of what will lay the tracks for the next wave of social mobility, 
the next wave of social mobility, and the next wave of creating ideas that fuel an economy. So with that, let me just uh, put out some questions here and just say that you know the diversity in this room is what's gonna activate this discussion. discussion. Uh, we will be our best university when each of us in this room can fully be our best selves. So I hope that you are willing to share all your thoughts, all your ideas. And let me just frame this up with three questions for today. Um, number one, what is your vision for UCF's future? And I would just like to frame it in this context of what does it mean to be a this century's, this next century's great university? And what do we need to, okay, sorry, I'm getting to my second question. What are our areas of greatest potential? So I do believe that uh, in the 20th century, you could create a University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and you could pick that University of Michigan up and all of its talent and put it in Phoenix, and it would be the same university. Uh, that's not gonna be the case with 21st century institutions. UCF is great in several of the areas that we're great in right now, tourism, optics and photonics, simulation, because of the unique demographics and geography of this region. So what, how does that play out over this next uh, 50 years? And then the third question, so one is what's your vision? Second is what are our areas of greatest potential? And the third one is how are we gonna get there? What are some actual ideas that we can start putting on the ground uh, to, to continue our aggressive move uh, toward leadership in this area? So I am now going to shut up. I've got my pen and I've got my journal up here. I may doodle a little bit, or I may write some things down, uh, but I'm gonna listen, and we're gonna spend, Tom, about 10 minutes on each of these questions. Sure. And as Tom promised, we'll reserve some time at the end uh, just to do business if there's anything. There's a lot going on at the university, uh, and I'm happy to address any of the issues or uh, uh, news items that you wanna talk about toward the end. But let's spend our time, first of all, dreaming. Tom? So you see, uh, there's two uh, uh, microphones here, don't be shy, and our first 10 minutes are gonna be focused on this first question, what is your vision for UCF's future? Any thoughts on that? You might start with what are the trends that may shape our future, if that helps get you going. Thank you. Got to be someone first. Hi, Dr. Whitaker. I am Robin Wright. I'm with the UCF Life Sciences Incubator here in Lake Nona. And we've been really up and operational since May of this year. We have seven labs, five offices. We are the first in Central Florida to have wet labs and also the first ones for the University of Central Florida. We're pretty proud of what we're doing. We're growing rapidly. We have quite a bit of um, interest in what we're doing. We are here in Medical City at the Guidewell Building. And um, I foresee so many different opportunities coming through with pharma, bio, the different ecosystems that we have that we're creating here. What is UCF's overall vision, do you think, for creating larger conceptions of this for us to continue to move forward? Because we are receiving so much attention that we're doing quality over quantity for our incubator. And we're just really proud, with, like I said, we have seven offices and five, seven labs and five offices, and we want to maintain this momentum to continue to grow. And I think this is one of the things that has opportunity for the University of Central Florida with everything that we've been doing with Research Park. But we have other companies that are coming into our incubator where we're a little bit limited for um, some of the science experiments, and we want to continue to grow that. And I didn't know if you might have any f feedback or thought on that. Um, I'm not going to respond to just by, by way of format to, uh, questions uh, in, this, in this context because I don't want to influence the creativity of thought by my own vision. But here's what I heard you say. What I heard you say is uh, in pharma and bio, you're seeing a demand that may indicate a trend mm -hmm. for birthing companies, or did you say companies moving in? Both. Okay, uh, so these are uh, job creators. So one of the possibilities here, 
that you see is this region, if we, if we double down, mm -hmm. this region having a market for uh, pharma and bio? Correct. Okay, excellent, thank you. I'm gonna try very hard not to be responsive uh, here and just listen. Good morning. Good morning, President Whitaker. I, I'm gonna try and, and phrase this correctly. What we see in our students is a desire for adaptability in terms of how they access information and learning, away from traditional didactic classes and innovative styles, which UCF has really pioneered in many ways. At the same time, there's also a creeping loneliness and higher burnout rate that speaks to a bigger need for mentoring. At the same time, there are demands for innovative learning that one can do on their own time. There's a disconnect with a feeling that your sense of a profession, regardless of what area, it doesn't have to be necessarily medicine. And I see a vision for UCF's future, one that incorporates strong mentoring so that students still have that role model. Um, one of the positives of the word you mentioned, pastoral, is feeling like you're cared for and nurtured. And I think we can't escape that as we move forward with a variety of opportunities because I believe our learners and ourselves need that kind of experience. I'm curious about the assumptions that's based on. So uh, is the assumption disconnection through technology or is the assumption disconnection through scale I or think it, geographic it, diffusion? It, I, think, I think it's technology to some extent. I think it's a learner style. As we offer more and more online courses, we can say here at the medical school, the students choose to learn um, more independently um, on, on their own time. At the same time, I'm, I'm sure that um, Dr. Daly's around, you can see the high, rise in anxiety levels in our students, the feeling um, disconnected or, or insecure in, in their um, paths forward in their professions. I think that there's a lot of drivers. Um, nationally, technology has increased learning possibilities so that you don't always have to use my didactic sections. You can get on to a wide variety of nationally available resources in order to do your learning if you don't feel like listening to me. So the students really are very adept mm -hmm. in this Google age at finding the best resources for how they want to learn certain material. But at the same time, they are yearning for a connectedness that you can't achieve from online. Um, and so while I appreciate that we have more non-traditional than the traditional students in our learning environment, students who hold jobs, students who need these online learning experiences, I think some of that, those offerings, though disconnect from the people okay. experience. Thank you. Um, so what I note from that is, uh, first of all, I believe that learning is a human endeavor. Correct. Um, you can learn material from a machine, but that's different than deep learning. So what I take from that is the, uh, as we use technology to individualize didactic learning, we need to think about scaling the human interaction and maybe deepening the human interaction. You put that much better than I could. Well, I'm, Thank you. I'm just trying to listen very carefully. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Uh, that's an excellent one. I think that's going to increase. Uh, uh, I'm trying not to judge, so I won't. You can, you can. But I agree with I, you. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so last 25 years, we focus on expanding, increase the number. But uh, now I think uh, we should focus on the quality. So that's the things I want to say. And uh, talking about the incubator, that's great. My company already in there and try to find the cure for the Alzheimer's disease. So, you know, we need to have something uh, more, what can I say? The uh, quality has more impact to the, the society. So that's the next uh, uh, focus. That's what I see. May I ask you just to expand a little bit on sure. what quality will look like? How would you measure it? How would you see it? Uh, I mean, so how would you know it when you saw it? How about that? Even the, uh, when I came here, the student quality was so low, unfortunately. So then, the, uh, uh, especially for the graduate student, 
we didn't have a good uh, graduate student coming in. And then the, although uh, we have the a very good uh, department, like optics and the engineering and computer science, but we didn't attract that kind of student which contribute to our uh, uh, community. Uh, just uh, we focus on the number of the uh, students. That's what I see. But the, now the quality, uh, very innovative research. That's what I see. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to have just a bunch of the ordinary people. At least we want to have some people having a very novel idea to push those things. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, quality will distinguish us. How we define quality, I think, is going to be the innovation. So I don't, you know, uh, some people define quality by traditional measures of the ability to take a test when you're 17 years old or 18 years old, but it doesn't predict innovation necessarily. So I think the challenge is how do we uh, identify talent that's going to be great, to your point? Uh, how, what, are the, how, what are the ways that a 21st century university identifies and develops that talent? And then, uh, to your point, adds as much value to that talent as possible during a very fixed time through experiences that we host uh, while they're here. Thank you. Uh, President Whitaker, uh, Joseph Meyerson, sir. Pleasure and thank you very much for coming. Uh, sir, if I can expand on what the professor was saying. I've only been here for 10 years, but in that time, what I've done, and I started out OPS, uh, you know, washing dishes and stuff, and now I'm a, a manager and uh, I've got a crew of excellent people that I work with. But what I've seen, sir, is that we have the appearance of every intent of doing everything absolutely the perfect best way, but we end up making so many compromises in order to just have a thing that we occasionally outpace our ability to deliver the kind of product that we want to be able to deliver to our stakeholders, not only to our, our, to our students and the parents, of course, but also to the community writ large and to each other and ourselves. And I think that that transition <clears throat> of mind is going to be a Herculean task, but it's one that I think we're up to and we yeah. must do because we have to take, there's so much that needs done and if not us, who? And if not now, when? So all in, sir, pleased and proud. <laughs> Thank you very kindly. <laughs> Thank you. You know, you're, you're putting words to a feeling that I've been having recently um, about this institution needing to take a deep breath and focus. And I don't know how to put that quite into words, but you did it. Uh, yeah, thanks, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and this will need to be our last question on this topic. <laughs> thank you. Um, Jim Bowie, UCF Business Incubator Program, uh, Kissimmee, Osceola County. And my vision for UCF is to be in a Power Five conference in the near future. <laughs> Go Knights. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I see to continue our trend as the leading partnership institution is that in our department of commercialization with UCF, we touch so many businesses in our nine locations throughout Central Florida that we get the support and the endearment from the local community because we are out there helping them. And I want us to continue to do that to make an impact in the communities like we have. Thank you. Um, again, I'm trying not to comment, but the, our new focus uh, with the Vice President of Partnerships and Innovation and New Division there is really because we have seen that impact through partnerships. Uh, and we know that when we focus down and double down on that, we're gonna see greater impact for the community. What this university does well, and what universities do well, is create talent and create ideas. And when a university is in partnership with partners who take the ideas and create jobs and businesses, and take the talent 
and employ the talent in a way that uh, has impact on society, then we've got a uh, we've got a well-oiled machine when those two things work together. Okay, R. Next question is: What are areas of greatest potential? And if I could briefly read something from uh, an email we got from Jason Burrell, um, it is a question, but I, I think we can talk about it in more general terms. Uh, Jason says, the regional economy is dependent upon creative environments, parks, themed attractions, and spaces that offer novel experience dominate local industry. Uh, Jason asks, how will UCF address the needs for students to learn innovative design? Uh, I think we could also say that that's an area Jason feels is a great potential uh, for us. Strategic opportunity. Thank you, Jason. I'm assuming you're right there. <laughs> Dr. Whitaker, good morning. David Miller. Hey, David. What I'd like to do, and I'm just so pleased that this is being hosted at the College of Medicine. It's very personal to me. And I'd like to speak from a public policy perspective and what we're really experiencing in this country, particularly in the Southeast, is an opioid crisis. And I think from an innovative perspective, it cre presents a unique opportunity for collaborative research, partnerships, we heard about pharma and others, but the talent here at this medical school and the life sciences college, I think, presents a unique opportunity. Not unlike in 2001 when the Rosen School was funded and we see 15 years later what that impact has on that industry on almost a global perspective. And I really think that this crisis is something University of Central Florida could take a leadership role on but do it in a collaborative and innovative manner that truly impacts not just the victim, but the families, public safety, and public policy. I think it presents a unique opportunity. Thank you, and, and really you have just led, I think, into this question, what are our areas of greatest potential? So these are areas where we have strength, where we are uniquely, maybe not uniquely, but um, distinctively differentiated because of our people or where we are in the world geographically uh, or the demographics of the uh, local region. Other areas where we have distinct advantage, great potential. I come from a tradition that thinks about a university as a place whose product is knowledge, uh, knowledge in uh, discovery is, or knowledge in creation is research, knowledge in practice is either service or patient care, and knowledge in transmission is education. So if you think about our three missions and you think about knowledge as our product, you can think about it that way. And I think most of the great universities of our country have focused on those, but the knowledge and service is the one that I think has had the weakest focus. And when I look at UCF and see our focus on partnerships, I see us as ahead of others in our knowledge and service because we partner with Siemens, we partner with Lockheed Martin, we partner way more than I think the average university does. Medical schools across the country do this service well through patient care. I think we have a unique opportunity in our medical city to take that knowledge and service uh, piece and not only do it through patient care, but through partnerships with the companies and the new entities that are coming. And I'd like to see that happen, not only in medicine, but across the university. Thank you. Other, other areas of greatest potential at UCF? Uh, can I say a little bit again? So then the uh, Florida, we are getting a lot of people comes in, especially the senior people. So then the, obviously the medical is the target area. But our university traditionally very strong in uh, engineering. And then the, 
the march of those technology towards the human uh, you know, health, I think that's the good, great potential for us. For example, the, the, you know, I'm collaborating with lots of uh, engineers, photonics. I ask the uh, photonic people if they can move the stem cells with the laser. They said, oh, that's easy. Just attract a beam. But unfortunately, the first experiment, they just cook the cells. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, after, yeah, after a while, <laughs> we discussed <laughs> and came up with a very good solution. So then the, that kind of things uh, could be the uh, future of our university. Yeah, I, I want to repeat back to you what I heard, not necessarily what you said, and that was uh, some of our distinctive advantages may be at the intersection of our strengths, like engineering and medicine. Uh, I know we've, you have talked about hospitality and medicine. We've talked about uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, modeling in healthcare or modeling in entertainment. So these uh, areas where we currently have some very strong peaks of strength, if we can build bridges across those, I think we can find some more peaks between them. Hi, I think we have an opportunity to be a leader in diversity at University of Central Florida um, because we live in such a diverse area in Central Florida and also a leader in the way we handle sexual harassment um, in our departments that are sort of prominently known for this being uh, more obvious, I guess. Um, I was at an event recently and I heard some things about UCF that I'd rather not hear that's happening still, it seems like. Um, so we shouldn't, I shouldn't be at another college hearing about negative things about UCF in that light. And I think we're too big to have that, that attention. Thank you. I, I, thank you. I think that kind of goes back to what is required of a 21st century university for every person to be fully free to be who they are, to bring themselves to work, not somebody, not a perception of themselves or an expectation of themselves to work, and then to be able to realize their full potential within a group of people who understand that the diversity of perspective and thought is the only way to a robust solution and to an innovation. Uh, I think it is a strict, Again, I'm not, I wasn't going to judge, but it is a strategic advantage. I couldn't agree more. We have time for uh, one more. On this uh, good, morning. good morning. I'm Patty Wright. I'm here representing the Economic Development Group for the Lake Nona Chamber of Commerce. And what we're going through is exactly what you're doing also. We're looking for our vision and how to connect. And what we are finding with all the companies and institutions and innovation that's coming into Lake Nona we're finding that there are more smaller circles of collaboration that are going on. And those people who are getting in the smaller circles are collaborating across the circles. Just like the gentleman was talking over here about the stem cells and who was finding a way to activate them. This is what we're seeing more and more and we're trying to put our hands out there in hospitality and helping these groups come together more often. So I think collaboration, as you know, is just paramount for the university. Thank you. So we're on to our final question here. How do we get there? So we've heard a little bit about maintaining human scale uh, in our learning experience, um, that we defining quality and making a focus of quality, making sure that we keep pace, uh, you know, our aspirations with our ability to deliver, Power Five conference uh, and some other uh, great, great ideas. Um, I did want to share uh, an email from Oliver Sapp that I think is pertinent to this. Uh, it is a question, but I think it can be spoken about as sort of a suggestion as well. How do we create an environment where students who are a part of the Rosen or regional or online communities feel engaged and connected? This connection often allows students to remain engaged long after they graduate. 
As a UCF Knight, it sometimes seems students at a satellite campus do not feel the connectability as in comparison with other institutions. Um, and Oliver goes on to talk about important to create partnership pipelines for our transfer students and those who may have a large number of credits when they transfer. Uh, that pipeline with key players like admissions, working with registrars, et cetera, would help get students who may be close to maxing out their financial aid to the finish line. Okay, now we're into the how-tos. What are some steps we can take? Morning, Dr. Whitaker. Morning, Thank you. Uh, I think an, a number of the items that came up this morning simply require people. So I think we need uh, faculty, we need instructors. We need enough infrastructure to support those folks, but the, the ground level activities with the students, in the labs, reaching out to our community partners, and faculty need bandwidth to be able to do that, to be creative, to write a paper, to get a grant, to drive across town for a one hour meeting when it takes you four hours really to do that one hour meeting. So um, I think we need, we need to right size the faculty and instructor side of the equation for the sheer number of uh, sheep to shepherds, going back to your pastoral role, <laughs> uh, you know, mathematics. Um, that would be one, one place we can work, I think. This is a, uh, well, uh, let, me, let me just note. Yes, agreed. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll comment. Uh, <laughs> You know, when, uh, when I came here, we had 800 tenure track faculty, 806 to be exact, and we're at about 1,100 now. And uh, University of Florida has closer to 3,000. So the, uh, when people talk about, uh, and, and during that time, we instructor lecture was about stable. So our growth was primarily in tenure track, but we certainly didn't uh, diminish instructor lecture. Um, and I want to make a point here because the, uh, when people talk about student to faculty ratio, the public thinks how many students are in a classroom, they like K through 12. You know that student to faculty ratio is really about bandwidth. It's really about, uh, at an institution like Purdue, the average teaching load was two courses a year, maybe three. And our average teaching load is probably double that. So uh, it really, people really are about bandwidth. And then each person having the ability to do what they do best. Uh, so a, a, an important part of our future is creating the budget model that fuels the growth of our talent. So more people. Yeah. Other thoughts, how will we get there? This is your chance to give advice to the president. From a student perspective, as I was especially hearing the independent learning and the technology, I also think us students need to sort of get that confidence more to take some advantage of some of these opportunities. I know myself, it wasn't until three years at the university I even felt the confidence to, to say hi to a professor walking past me in the hallway. I think we get so locked up in our studies and in our computers that we forget that. And um, I think as students, you know, if the faculty is putting in their work as well, we need to know we are at a collegiate level and put in that work as well to make those partnerships and make those mentorships um, happen as well. So just giving my thought on that. Thank you. You know, in our uh, current structure, let's see, 120 divided by three is 40. In our current structure, a undergraduate student would have 40 professors plus or minus three uh, over a four year period. Um, and if I were to ask you how many of your professors changed your life, I, I would even ask you this, how many can you call the first and last name of? All, almost all of you will be able to do at least one, about half of you will be able to do two, and about 10% of you will be able to do three. So one of the things I think about a lot is we don't have to sustain a deep uh, 
relationship with 40 professors, we need to make sure that every student has a deep relationship with one and maybe two. And you know, with our numbers, with our ratios, 30 to one, that's approximately eight students per cohort, eight to 10 freshmen, eight to 10 sophomores, you know, just thinking about it that way. So I know it's very simplistic on my part, but it's not irrational. Thank you. Okay, so I have a whole list. All right. Uh, so Note Dr. takers, Sin, get, so your, get Dr. your pens Sin, ready. So Dr. Sindon mentioned really what equates to human capital. So I think it's not only about the, having enough human capital, but using them in the most efficient and effective ways, which are not necessarily the adjectives I would use to describe any university process. We aren't necessarily very efficient are very effective at, not just here, at, I've been at three different universities, it, actually four. There's a lot of governance, there's a lot of committees, there's a lot of, um, and I was joking uh, at dinner the other night about even changing the name of a governance structure would require a committee to go through and vote on changing the name. So I think if you think about the future and the ability to be able to move on a dime and yes. be very responsive, be very creative, we have to think about our structure and, and how it either supports that ability or bogs us down. Yeah. Um, so I would think about one of the ways that we think about the 21st century university is we have to get much more efficient much more um, effective and much more strategic about how we use our resources so that resources are getting allocated um, where there's gonna be the highest impact in relationship to their use. Um, I see that in two areas. I just wanted to note it if you would agree with us. One of those is in our practices, our business practices and so on. And uh, the other is in uh, shared governance. So the great 20th century universities were run by faculty, but often faculty did things like our university does as wide as parking. Uh, does that really, to uh, uh, I think it was Juan's point of view about bandwidth, are we really using the bandwidth of our faculty and our staff at the optimum rate? So there, that's something I'd like to explore for what that means in the 21st century. Right, yeah. so what's the best Thank use you. of a faculty member's time? And if you think about people working at their highest level of expertise, sitting in committee meetings talking about toilet paper in the bathrooms is probably not the, the best use of that faculty Amen. member's time. Um, and I'm being ornery here, but that you can. Well, go on, you got a whole list of. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, um, so we also have a very job description task uh, governance, and so rather than thinking about things that are project-based. So there may be administrative staff who are slow or who need to have some developmental um, things happen in their lives, who've been doing the same job over and over again, but we have new opportunities that have come up and we need different people on those. So figuring out how to have a project-based work uh, assignment versus just necessarily a job description so that people can be moving in and out of new opportunities and, and getting new skill development, getting exposure to things that are going on in their college or in their university, and they're not necessarily just stuck at their desk doing their same thing over and over again. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that leads to turnover because they don't see opportunities for new development. Um, ability to quickly shift focus processes and goals, creative and collaborative workspaces. Mm -hmm. um, we don't necessarily have the, and I think at the College of Medicine, we're probably more fortunate than other places because we're so new. They thought about that more. Um, uh, I think that shaping the degrees so that they're related to job fit rather than an expertise in a discipline. So I could graduate as an engineer or graduate as an educator, but not get a job because I, I'm now, I'm an expert and I know a lot about education, but I don't know anything about how do I, um, 
How do I work on a team to address um, how to educate patients, for example? So we don't think, we think about, dis about graduating somebody who's really good at a discipline, but not really good at getting a job that's available to them. I don't know if I've said that correctly. Um, oh, I hear you. I think that's, I think that covers a lot of my list. And then also, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm a futurist, so kind of this perpetual looking at what's going on out there mm -hmm. and how can we get ahead of it rather than having to be responding to it. Yeah, skate to the puck. Um, as you were talking about uh, putting teams together for jobs or for projects, as you were talking about creative space, I was thinking about the difference between 20th century companies like a Ford or an IBM and 21st century companies like a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon in the way that they uh, deploy people. Uh, and we're still behaving very much like a 20th century uh, university and there's a lot of opportunity to learn, probably not from other universities, but probably from the military and from uh, other companies. Thank you. We're in the final 15 minutes here. You can address at this point any of these topics or any other topic you'd like. Hello. Good okay, morning. can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, guys. I'm glad to make it over here. I am from COBA, the College of Business Administration. And there are a group of us who have some concerns that we would like to address regarding the college. Um, class size is one of them. GEB, I knew, I transferred from Valencia, I knew it would be bigger, of course, but 1,700 people is unacceptable. It's difficult to know your professor with 200, let alone 1,700. Seeing that we have so many people in one class, I believe we deserve a discount on tuition. Imagine how much of the professor's attention we can truly capture. Even 200, to me, is still big. But um, the reduced seating format has been recently introduced by Dr. Jarley. I admire his um, love of innovation and trying to use the resources that he has to the best of his ability. But for many of us, it's not working out. We only meet five times. We're used to meeting 10, maybe approximately 15 times, give or minus you know, the public holidays. So essentially, we wind up teaching ourselves. And we're paying up to $200 over plus for these books from McGraw-Hill. So web courses for my class is only used for grading. And I'm shelling out more money for web courses. The teacher only puts maybe three or five minute videos, so I'm not getting that much content directly from the professor. Class specifically I want to talk about is ACG um, for decision makers. Ray Stern teaches that. He apparently also teaches some finance classes. Now, I was told the College of Business as a whole schedules the reduced seating format classes. He was double booked for the same time, and so we've had two sessions. The first time, it was only one TA and 200 of us in that room. He was not there. The second time, he was not there. I asked the TA, will we be seeing professor in class? She said no, because he's been double booked. That's absolutely unacceptable. The college has been around for 50 years. You guys are not rookies. I know somebody made a mistake, and they should own up and take responsibility and say that we did it. I believe personally that we deserve a discount for only meeting five times. Why would I pay the same amount as a, time, as a class that meets 10 times? Why would I pay? the same amount for less service. And the fact that the professor is not there, I don't know why they decided the other class is more important, but we paid our tuition just like them, we did our test just like them, and we deserve the same respect, equal treatment. So personally, I don't know about everybody else, but I would like a refund. I think that's unacceptable. And so there's a petition called Knights for COBRA Reform. We don't want to eliminate reduced seat format because some people, they are full-time moms, dad, jobs. It's very difficult for the schedule, so they like it. So we don't want to eliminate it from them, but we just want choices for the university. Maybe a hybrid class that meets once a week, but we need to change some things. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks for That's your a question. Good feedback. I appreciate your voice. And actually, if you want to talk to Christine there in the orange, uh, she might be able to help as well. Hi. This is uh, related to how do we get there. Okay. Um, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are changing. Decisions need to be made. I think one of the critical things is to have faculty at the table at the beginning of those decisions. There's many things we see here at the university where something's decided and then it's disseminated to faculty and that we were not involved in the design of policies for this or regulations for that or, or plans for where we're going in the future. Um, I think this is critical because the faculty has a very different perspective than the administration on what's actually happening out there in the various schools and departments. 
Um, is it fair to say that the faculty senate is the representative voice of the faculty in that case? It doesn't. It does not have to be the senate, and you don't need to have a senator to do this. Um, and sometimes it's great not to. I mean, there's, there's, you know, currently, you know, the the faculty senate, although we're trying to address it, um, instructor instructors and lecturers aren't members of the senate, but sometimes they have a great voice. Yep. So and, uh, it, 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 it's like, a broad thing. I'd like to put this on the on the piece with uh, one and creating bandwidth. Uh, and I'm sorry, what was your name? Mine, sir. Joseph no. Marston, sir. I'm sorry. Be, thank. Uh, behind. Denise. 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 Uh, about creativity as we go forward to make sure that we have the voices at the table at the right time, but but not um, uh, not wasting time on things that are not high transactional or high value. Let's I say. understand that. There's also certainly sometimes the same select faculty are in high demand, and that's where the bandwidth comes in for more people that can you know be involved and help out. Yeah, good, great point. This, Thank you. This is a design opportunity. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Your turn. I'm the moderator. Oh, I'm going to say you go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, good morning, President Whitaker. Uh, my name is Stephanie Rivera Velasquez, and kind of piggybacking off of Dr. K, who was incredibly eloquent in, in, her, um, in her statement. Um, I believe that there's definitely some changes that need to be implemented as far as um, employee satisfaction. Um, so for example, you stated that we are kind of stuck in the 20th century and, and you kind of um, compared us to Google. And when I think of UCF, I think of innovation, but I, I do believe that we're kind of stuck in the 20th century. So for example, a current issue that we're facing here at Calm is lack of space, lack of office space, lack of meeting space. And it's gotten to the point where we're kind of doubling and tripling up in offices. Um, I propose a solution of, of flex scheduling, of telecommuting, and I, it's been received almost like a, a no-no, and I believe it's an archaic way of thinking. Um, research actually shows um, that increased productivity and enhanced quality of life is, is actually a result of telecommuting. Um, so I'm kind of wondering what your views are on, on innovative ways of changing the workplace. I am a, so are we in the answering the questions mode? We are. Okay. <laughs> I, I am a big fan of innovation. Uh, I also know that it's very specific to the project, the work, and the workplace. So there are times when it may, when human collective uh, interaction is really, really important. And so some companies, for example, have core hours where everybody really needs to be face to face during core hours and then they flex other hours. So I wouldn't want to speak for the specific role, function, or the team. Um, but uh, I'm very open to, to innovation and flexibility, especially where it increases productivity and life satisfaction. Good morning, Dr. Whitaker. Good morning. Um, not surprisingly, I, I'm, I would, as far as the how, I would advocate philanthropy. Amen, uh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one, one example of that, I think, is the immediate past provost, in a very wise move, decided to, uh, we'll think about that one for a minute, in a very wise move, uh, decided to incent donors to fund faculty positions. And, you know, as a medical school, one of the issues that I think almost most medical schools face is the ability to recruit a diverse faculty. And that's one of those areas where programs like that, I think, could really aid us and give us an upper hand in, in recruiting those, the ability to recruit those faculty. Um, and then the, the only other thing I would add is, is telling our story mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. getting it out there and getting that word out there. And I would advocate for the marketing area for resources put in that, and Tom did not you know, put me up to this or anything, <laughs> but marketing resources to tell our story and to continue to get it out in front of people to bring the dollars we need to make all of these things happen. Thank you. Um, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, on the telling our story, uh, 
probably some of you have heard me say this several times, so I'll say it one more time. And that is that reputation lags reality. And there are great institutions in this country where their reality, where their reputation is now beyond their current reality. Uh, in other words, they're in decline. We're a place where our reality is way ahead of our reputation, especially as you get outside of Central Florida. So um, I take it as one of my tasks, and 40% of my time is committed to telling this institution's story so that people understand how good we are right now and where it is that we're going. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Whitaker. I'm Carrie Hernandez. I'm a faculty member and physician here at the College of Medicine. I think universities also play an important sort of social, cultural, and political role. Um, and as an immigrant and a child of immigrants, um, I would love to see our institution keep the American dream alive. And in no other country in the world could I, the child of a farmer and a seamstress, have become a physician. And um, I would like to see us preserve that. So. Oh, totally committed. I, I think our, maybe I didn't say it, uh, but for a 21st century institution, this idea of the third, um, the third lift of the American population, of the population, especially low and medium income, which is where so much talent is right now trapped. It's trapped there. We need to be an institution that opens that. Right now, I think we are. I think we're a model institution for providing access and success. Uh, and we'll stay totally committed. We have time for one more question. All right. Good morning. My name is Arbra Calvert. I'm on the board of directors of the Lake Nona Regional Chamber of Commerce. And I'm, I'm the director of membership. And one of the things that I'm always trying to address for our chamber is how to provide a return on investment for our membership, you know, trying to provide that value. And I know these are things that, as part of the university, you're also considering. In your opening remarks, you had talked a little bit about uh, how the veterans coming back from World War II mm -hmm. had that program that enabled them to attend university. And it, it, it did so many good things for the university. It brought in a diversity of people. It brought up a whole different social class of individuals. And it brought them up and, and allowed them to become productive citizens and making more money than they otherwise would. When I look at the 21st century, and I look at our students that we have now, and you, you see reports of people coming out of, uh, with a four or six year degree with $100,000, $200,000 worth of debt, and it concerns me. It makes me begin to believe that uh, university education is now getting out of the reach of ordinary folks. Now, I know the College of Medicine here did some very innovative things. As you know, with Dr. German, the, the, I think the first graduating class of the doctors, it was completely free through some innovative programs, through trying to get donors and things like that. So when we look at what the vision is for this university, we look at our potential and how we're going to get there, I, I have to believe that there's some way that we can come up with programs and be innovative to through philanthropy to help fund uh, some education through service, much like military service or community service. People can, or students can volunteer their time or go into a program that then allows them as a benefit of serving a period of time can get a college education. So what I'd like to propose to you is having some innovative programs, perhaps a think tank that come up with ways that you can not only fund the university through philanthropy of funding uh, your, your professors, but coming up with a way to fund the students and to where it's not necessarily just free for everybody, perhaps it's a combination of service. So as, as a way to, <laughs> you know, grow the university as a way to be innovative, as a way to get where we want to be. 
have you considered trying to do and work with uh, local companies, whether or not it's even companies that uh, uh, would fund the programs to where when it's over, they would have employees or have employees that work for them for so many years or in credits to then go through a system that can then help that particular bus business. So anyway, I'm just trying to think out of the box of return on investment, ways to grow this university, ways to where we don't burden uh, our, our future workers with uh, so much debt. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I'll just respond to it. Uh, I think uh, there are many opportunities that we haven't found or explored yet. Uh, but let me do bust a myth right here. And that is that 45% of our students graduate with no debt. 55% of our students graduate with debt. Our average debt is $10,000 less than the national average, which is 30,000. So there's a lot of this discourse around, around 200 and 300,000. Those are mostly students that never graduated and they went to very expensive universities. Um, I'm very pleased to say not only are we the number one source of talent now in the United States, but we're also at the lowest cost per degree awarded in the United States. So it's a, uh, it has taken a lot of innovation to get there. I think we need to add more cost so we can add more people, so we can add more quality. Uh, and then like, the other piece that you mentioned, uh, the one that we haven't done well at yet, I think, is Juniata College, are you familiar with it? And is it Kentucky? Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Juniata, Berea. Berea's in Kentucky. So Berea was always founded on this idea for the Appalachia, uh, Appalachian people that you could get college free, but you had to do work. And we have 12,000 jobs at UCF, just UCF alone has 12,000 jobs. Um, are, do we have really good opportunities for students to hold those jobs and to elevate their responsibilities over the years so that when they're entering the workplace, they have, you know, they are, uh, have supervisory responsibilities like anybody else that have been working four years. An example that is a success is our Lockheed Martin program that's had 650 students now. They're working full, full on jobs, 20 hours a week, getting paid real salaries. Uh, at competitive rates as if they were working there and going to school, basically um, getting their degrees at the same time. That's one example. If we had 30 companies like that, 30 examples, uh, it would be outstanding. So great ideas. Hey, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, even more so, I'd like to thank you for your brain cells. For me, this has been incredibly useful. I know that there are people in here we haven't heard from yet. So, uh, Tom, do you have a, a, a recommendation for how they can give us their ideas? Absolutely. So this concludes this particular conversation, uh, but there will be one at tomorrow's forum, 11 a.m. in the Pegasus Ballroom. You can submit feedback to dale.whitaker at ucf.edu. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Go Knights. Charge on.